Welcome to the Beyond the Crucible podcast. I'm Gary Schneeberger, the Communications Director for Crucible Leadership. And, uh, I want to thank you for joining us. On Beyond the Crucible, we take a look at crucible moments, those painful, life-changing experiences that leave us changed from the person we were before. We discuss how we can use those experiences, those refining times to lead a life of significance. It's not an easy process. I don't have to tell you that because you, if you've been through a crucible moment, you know it's not an easy process. But it can be the most rewarding journey you take if you can commit to learning the lessons of your crucible. Those lessons can help you lead a life that's on purpose and dedicated to helping others. And our host, crucible leadership founder Warwick Fairfax, knows that from personal experience. Warwick, it's great to be here with you today on this kind of exciting day as the first episode of Beyond the Crucible. Absolutely, Gary. Uh, thanks so much for being here and um, yeah, looking forward to it. You know, it occurred to me as I was, I was thinking about this that this moment, the first episode of Beyond the Crucible is in a lot of ways the, a culmination of a story that no hyperbole at all began on the day you were born. Um, <laughs> let's rewind for folks to the, I mean, truly to the beginning. And who was Warwick Fairfax when this journey to a life of significance began? Well, it's interesting. The day I was born, my life was pre-programmed, preordained, if you will. Um, I was born into this 150-year-old family media business started by my great-great-grandfather, John Fairfax. Uh, so it was a large, uh, very large company in Australia. It had the equivalent of the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal. It had uh, TV stations, newspapers, radio, magazines, newsprint mills. It really had the dominant opinion leading uh, publications of the country. So um, really from birth, uh, I was a fifth generation. I was seen certainly by my parents as the heir apparent. And so my whole life was, what do I need to do to prepare myself? And kind of certainly a uh, subtext, if you will, was hmm. you better not make any mistakes. <laughs> Because if I screw up, it's on the right. front page of the newspaper. So I worked hard and you just, you avoid doing dumb stuff. You avoid, you know, um, doing things that will uh, make your parents look bad, make you look bad. So kind of in, in the goldfish bowl uh, from birth. And if this were a movie, right? If they made a movie about mm -hmm. your life and it was stereotypically mm -hmm. Hollywood, that wouldn't necessarily be the young man who is the fifth generation heir to an enormous media dynasty. I mean, we tend to think of those folks as being kind of, you know, devil may care and not very responsible. Mm -hmm. that, that wasn't you. You were responsible. You were committed to being the fifth generation head of the family business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, you're right. Not everybody in family businesses who grew up with wealth are like that many, you know, just drive around Ferraris, go party in Monte Carlo or wherever. And that's, you know, private jets, and uh, that wasn't who I was. My parents actually didn't raise me that way, even though we lived in a nice house. My dad had a lot of nice cars, you know, Rolls and what have you. They never really gave me too much in terms of, uh, oh, I don't know, money to spend. My first mm -hmm. car was actually, uh, uh, I went to Oxford, so I needed a car there. It was like a, a Renault 5, which is a small, kind of boxy European car, I actually paid for half of it with my own money from an internship I had in advertising, funnily enough. Um, but um, yeah, so I always worked hard at school, got good grades, because uh, I wanted to live up to the expectations that my parents had of me. So, so the last thing I wanted to be was this, um, uh, you know, party guy that, um, spent money and just um, didn't take life seriously. That was sort of exactly who I didn't want to be. Uh, that was sort of etched in my brain. I understand the alternative. Right. And the whole duty on a country, if you will, um, 
that was absolutely me. I took it, yeah, I took it very seriously. You used a phrase, you wanted to live up to expectations, which is really mm -hmm. interesting because, you know, a lot of times my, uh, my stepson is a senior in high school. So we talk about what do you want to do? What's your dream for your life? Mm -hmm. And you didn't really have that opportunity. The expectations that you were trying to live up to weren't necessarily your own, right? These were your family expectations. So in terms of deciding what it is you wanted to be, you didn't really have a lot of choice in that, did you? No, I mean, that was sort of an irrelevant question. Um, you know, it's, there's something about a, a newspaper company. It's not just making widgets, you know, mm. um, it's, doing uh, a public good is providing a public service. Uh, when you have the, the quality opinion leaders, you feel like you're serving the good of the nation, if you will, to um, uh, expose people that need to be exposed, ideally, you know, report fairly, uplift those who need to be uplifted. I realize it doesn't always work that way in real life in the media, but right. those were the goals. And uh, certainly my father and people before him took it all very seriously to have a quality independent paper. Um, it's kind of interesting, the original masthead uh, when my great great grandfather bought it in 1841 was called May Whigs Call Me Tory and Tory mm. Call Me Whig, which in modern language is May Conservatives Call Me Liberal and Liberals Call Me Conservatives. So it was always an independent newspaper, even back in the 1800s when very few newspapers were independent. You're either left or right. And, the U.S. and most other countries, but it's right. always that was uh, the ethos, the attempt to be an independent paper. So, with all of that, there was a sense of how could you not want to go to something that served such a great public good, and there was such a legacy of service within my family. You think of some families in the U.S., whether it's uh, Roosevelt's or the Bushes. There's this, in that sense, of uh, great notion of public service, public mm -hmm. duty. Similar kind of thing in my family, except it was newspaper. So the idea of what do you want to do in life was irrelevant. And it's not so much I was browbeaten into this. It was just clear right. that what my parents wanted, what my father wanted, who I dearly loved. And um, so that was just the notion. So therefore I went to Oxford like my dad did and you know, grandfather, older brother, um, worked on Wall Street to get experience in finance because most of my family, including my dad, were more journalists and writers, mm -hmm. uh, and then went to Harvard Business School. All not so much because I wanted to do those things per se. Uh, I don't know that I even think of myself as a business guy, but um, I'm probably more of a reflective advisor, a little bit more like my dad in some ways, but it was all, what, what skills do I need? How do I need to prepare myself? Uh, so kind of that's what I did. It was, you know, while other people like at Harvard Business School were interviewing with, I don't know, firms on Wall Street or management consultants, that was, the whole thing was irrelevant. I, I knew what my almost God-given preordained purpose mm -hmm. in life was, and I was going to try and live up to it the best I could. So you mentioned you're at Harvard Business School. So let's pick the story up again, because it, it's Harvard Business School. Um, that's going to be where your crucible, I mean, right after that is going to be where your crucible moment starts to kick in. So you're at Harvard Business School, you graduate, um, things are going on in the family business that maybe it's time for Warwick to step in. What happened next? Well, um, as I was in my last year at Harvard Business School, uh, my dad died in early 87. He was in his uh, mid 80s by then. I was actually uh, from my dad's uh, third marriage. Um, uh, so at that, um, it really was a catalyst to a series of events. There'd been turmoil in the family for quite a number of years. Uh, some other members of, of my family had thrown my dad out as chairman in 1976 when I was 15, which was traumatic obviously i love my father deeply so i you know there might have been another side to it but all i saw is you know other family members stabbing my right. fam, my, my dad in the back right so um from that point on uh the pressure was ratcheted up the sense that um while there were others involved in the family business um 
they saw me as the heir apparent and just in terms of shareholdings, I would inherit, but that was sort of a likely scenario that I would be the leading shareholder, you know, one day within the family. So uh, after my dad died, the stock price of the company started rocketing up. 50% 50% of the company was publicly held and the, the rest by the family. So this is back in the 80s. So the market felt that um, if some uh, corporate raider launched a takeover, mm-hmm. that all you would need to do is pick off uh, a few percentage of shareholdings or more and the rest would fall like dominoes, was the theory. Right. Um, so um, I didn't want the company to be taken over. I, like my parents, had issues with management, felt like it wasn't being manage that well, maybe the papers were a bit more sensational than perhaps they'd been in years past, but um, for a variety of reasons, I felt like something would need to be done. So um, while I was uh, at Harvard, I would be talking to uh, advisors back in Australia (laughs) in terms of building a takeover, they'd be talking to banks. You know, I was uh, 26 at the time. It was kind of crazy, you know, working by day and, uh, at night, um, if the time difference, kind of working to organize a right. takeover. And so in late August 1987, I launched a $2.25 billion Australian dollar takeover. Um, and uh, biggest takeover, one of the biggest anyway, in Australian corporate history. And uh, from being somebody that was, you know, my name was known, I was pretty anonymous, at that point, I'm on front page of newspapers, on TV, at least my images. And uh, I went from somebody who's naturally reserved to just my picture being everywhere. So it was very uncomfortable, to say the least. Uh, things kind of went wrong from the start. Uh, the rest of my family didn't really want to be uh, locked into a private company owned by a 26-year-old, which <laughs> I can frankly understand. <laughs> yeah. And I wasn't anticipating that they would sell, which was a colossally stupid assumption. Um, So that added up, added enormously to the debt once they sold the October 87 stock market crash at our asset sales. So we had an enormous amount of debt. And yes, I brought a new management. They increased operating profits by 80%, which maybe showed that the company could have been better managed, but it was sort of a pyrrhic victory, if you will, because the debt was so high that it didn't matter what management at an operating level. It was just an unsustainable level of debt. So in late 1990, Australia got in a huge recession. Newspapers are very cyclical, which was the driver behind the company revenues and the company went bankrupt. So my goal had been to launch the takeover to change management and preserve family control. And what I did end up directly um, going against my whole goal in life, which is to preserve the family company for future generations. So um, needless to say, it was absolutely devastating at that point. Yeah. Let's camp here for just a second. Um, First of all, you said 2.25, not million, but... Billion, I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So it was, I mean, it was truly enormous and it was... I mean, it was a great loss, but right. the the devastation that you felt seems to me, and when I've heard you talk about this, was less about the money and more about the sense of having let down your parents, having let down, you know, in, in some ways you had to feel like you let down the country in a sense that, right, this was a, a watchdog for the country. So is it safe to say that the devastation, the crucible, right? That, that moment of refinement, that, that terrible, terrible moment was less about money and more about sort of the emotion and the, and the feeling that you let people down. That's absolutely right. Um, you know, money has never really been a motivator for me. I grew up with lots of money. We were at the top of the social spectrum, if you will, uh, prime ministers, ambassadors, even Hollywood people, you know, Liberace, Kirk Douglas, what have you, they would visit. So, you know, exclusive clubs. I mean, I grew up with all that and I could just see money doesn't really make you happy. I, you know, we could see it in the lives of people that would come to the parties we would have, which would be pretty lavish, pretty amazing. So 
money was never been a motivator for me. So we, yes, in theory, I lost billions, but it's not something that I ever really saw mm. or, you know, lived off of at least myself. So it, no, it wasn't the money. It was more the sense that um, I'd let my dad down, you know, my parents, my ancestors. Uh, that was, you know, those two things would do. I mean, I mean the, letting my family down was probably the biggest devastation. Um, and the other, which in some very strange way, I almost felt like I let God down. Mm. And so just to kind of explain that, why on earth I would say that is um, the company was founded um, back in 1841 by a very strong believer, uh, somebody of great faith who you know, came out from England. He um, had a small paper, a lawyer sued him. Uh, the judge found in John Fairfax's favor that the story was accurate, but court costs bankrupted him, came out and started this um, great newspaper, you know, it was an elder at his church. So, um, you know, faith become a bit more traditional by the time I came around. Um, my dad was a bit more ecumenical in his beliefs. I grew up in an Anglican background in Australia, but when I was at Oxford, um, I uh, went to a local evangelical Anglican church and faith became very important in my life. So I felt in some ways that you know, I was never going to have, you know, Jesus lives or something <laughs> crazy on the front page of the paper, but more, right. you know, treat people with respect, honor them, respect them, have uh, newspapers that would report fairly and honestly and accurately. And so it was more the, uh, the principles. I mean, he ran a great company, John Fairfax, his employees loved him. Um, strong marriage, kids loved him. So it was more just uh, feeling like God had a plan that, you know, somebody else would have the kind of faith that John Fairfax had and somehow there was this divine plan and I blew it. And so that right. was, obviously that was naive and from my perspective, if God had wanted that to happen, it would have happened and take over was succeeded. So it was faulty theology, uh, faulty thinking, but, yeah, the sense that I let down my family in a sense somehow let, you know, wrecked some divine plan. It, it was just, yeah, it was just shattering. It was, yeah. it was absolutely devastating. And that is, is what makes a crucible, right? What makes your crucible so devastating, so shattering is the word you used, um, is that it's that emotional, that, that feeling that you let people down. So let what happened next? I mean, you didn't jump back. As you told the story, that was 86, 87. That was the 80s. That was 30 some years ago. So what happened to you in the intervening time? And how did you begin the process in that intervening time to start getting back on a path where you could pursue a life of significance? Yeah, I mean, it. Um, well, firstly, I came to America. Um, I met my wife, who's American, uh, in Australia. And so she got a bit of a taste of all the uh, <laughs> tumult and right. uh, turmoil. And uh, it's funny, the day the company went under, uh, there were three TV networks, the equivalent of CBS, ABC, NBC, that were camped out on the doorstep. We had just a, you know, kind of more my way of doing things, a modest house in the suburbs, somewhere of Sydney. And Gail, my wife, I think was going out to get groceries or what have you. And She's like, oh, maybe not. <laughs> it's like, I didn't we'll sign up for that. <laughs> we'll eat leftovers today. <laughs> exactly. If you came from just a, a very normal family in Ohio, and yeah, she didn't grow up the way I did at all. Um, so um, yeah, so we moved to America, uh, initially to Chicago, where she had lived for a number of years, but then to Annapolis, outside of Washington, D.C., where I've, we've lived ever since the early 90s. And yeah, for a lot of the 90s, I mean, it was just, I mean, I was not in good shape. Mm. I mean, it just, I don't know what my friends thought. It's like, you know, will he ever kind of put the pieces back together? Or they probably felt sorry for me, I suppose. I don't know quite what, but yeah, I was just not in good shape because my whole purpose in life was gone. Uh, 
you know, try getting a job, but try getting a job with a resume that says, you know, ex media mogul. Right. It's like, I'm humble. I'm willing to work anywhere. <laughs> oh yeah. Right. Of course you are. <laughs> Please next. Yeah. You know? Right. Right. Um, so it was hard. Um, so I guess some of the building blocks in which I, you know, clawed my way back to having some modicum of self-esteem. Uh, one was the notion that, um, you know, God loves me uh, and loves everybody unconditionally. He didn't need Fairfax Media. He didn't need, you know, my good works or my, he didn't need my stuff, if you will. Um, but we're all children of God. And that sense of unconditional love, I mean, even knowing that in my head, it was still really hard because it's hard to believe that. Right. Deep in your soul when a crushing experience happens. But yet, that was certainly the foundation. Um, and just this notion that if God had wanted it to happen, despite my stupid mistakes and assumptions, um, I guess it maybe would have happened. But uh, the second thing is just having a loving wife and family that, um, you know, I mean, we may have lost you know, billions technically, but we weren't on the streets. We were fine. We were living right. a reasonably modest lifestyle, but, you know, we were okay. Um, and my kids, you know, they were obviously very young in the 90s. They didn't know anything about Australia back then. Obviously, I'm not going to fiddle them in when they're, you know, toddlers about, right. you know, take over. And it's like, right. say what? You know, yeah. Uh, but uh, they just knew me as daddy, so to speak. So that was an element, uh, my faith, my family. And then as I began to get um, different jobs, really the first one was um, working at a local aviation services company doing um, financial and uh, business analysis. Uh, this is like pre-internet, so right. I didn't know who I was. I mean, it was just pre-internet internet but not enough that you just googled everybody it was just right you know, wasn't, <laughs> hadn't quite happened yet well that was um, fortuitous yeah it was so i didn't advertise it frankly um but i worked hard and got good performance reviews and all uh and so i, I began to think okay there's something i can do without screwing up i mean mm. yes you know i was paid like really low and i remember thinking i've got to be in the lowest Harvard Business School graduate in history. Right. Um, right. And again, I don't care about money, but the self-esteem thing uh, yeah. didn't help. But I think gradually I kind of felt like, okay, I, you know, I'm pretty good at you know, analytically and I'm actually making a positive contribution somewhere. Right. So that was, you know, uh, a, a little brick on the way to building my self-esteem back. So that was certainly one, the first key move, right. the first key element. And that was a bloom, right? That was like right. things hadn't grown for a while in terms of exactly. your, your self-esteem, but that was a bloom, a little flower. Something, something right. came up that bloomed and you were able to connect those things and, and keep going. And, and yeah. what was the next development professionally where you were able mm -hmm. to realize that your experience, your crucible, the way that you dealt with that could help other people? Yeah, I mean, there were really a couple of, next steps in those first few years of the 2000s. One was I felt like where I was in aviation services that I was playing small. Mm. I wasn't using all the gifts that frankly God had given me. Not that there's anything wrong with doing that, but I felt like I'd been given gifts and I wasn't using them. And so I came to the point where I um, went to a woman that did uh, mid-career assessments and she said, you know, you've got a great profile for executive coaching. Of course, I said, what's executive coaching? <laughs> you know, went to some conferences and I went, this is, this is me. I'm, uh, I like learning. I'm curious about people, love asking questions. So as I began to do that, I began to realize that I had a leadership voice. I would ask questions and people would say, well, that's a great point. And I'm thinking, well, what point? I'm just asking a question, <laughs> but yet, uh, you know, because remember my self-confidence was so low. I, right. I, mean, I felt like, you know, I couldn't leave myself out of a paper bag. I mean, I felt like I was just, you know, you know, I just need to leave stuff alone and not mess it up. So I'm, you know, it took a while for me to think that I could contribute anywhere at all. So that, that, that was another building brick. And then probably one of the biggest turning points at this time was um, in 2003, 
uh, you know, we go to a non-denominational um, church here in Annapolis and uh, lead pastor of the church said, well, I'm giving this message on the life of David. You know, he's running away from Saul. who was persecuting him because, you know, he was doing a good job and he's getting jealous and wanted to kill him. And it's kind of weird. But um, so I want, you, I want you to give a seven minute, il seven minute illustration of a righteous man falsely persecuted. He says, well, I don't know about a righteous man falsely persecuted. I brought a lot of it on myself, most of it, but fine. Right. So I told my story. Obviously, it's a church um, weaving in a faith element to it about what I went through and what I felt like the Lord had taught me maybe about, you know, a lot of different things. Um, certainly that, um, you know, he doesn't need, or, you know, all the things that we think that maybe he needs from us. He just needs us not all of our stuff and what have you so what was interesting in the weeks and months afterwards people said boy Warwick that really helped me thank you so mm. much and I'm thinking well how could it help anybody <laughs> there aren't right. a bunch of media moguls sitting in the congregation they're just a cross-section right. of relatively normal people so that's when I thought if somehow my story um of what I went through and, and the loss and devastation and clawing my self-esteem back, if that can help other people, then it's worth talking about. I'm not into just telling my story just, right. just because, you know, it's, it's, it's fun to relive these painful memories in some warped sense. Right. If it can help other people, then it's worth talking about. So that was one of the most critical turning points. And you discovered in that process that the, the specifics of your story, the specific, you know, it was in Australia and it was a, it was a big numbers of money and it was newspapers and influence. Those were less important in terms of the impact on people than the emotions that you went through, right? That feeling of failure, that feeling of letting people down, that feeling of kind of wanting to hide away from that, that mm -hmm. feeling of being shattered, as you said, those were things that are universal, right? Absolutely. And what's interesting to me is, you know, people don't like talking about failure. It's one thing to talk about a severe injury, right. which, you know, in 99.9% .9 of the cases, it's not your fault. You know, right. stuff happens. Um, and it's devastating, but you're not ashamed. You feel maybe terrible. You know, how can I contribute to life? But in this case, when it's a failure, which in large part I caused, Right. You know, business leaders write books about follow me because I'm a successful CEO. They don't say, hey, I've got I've written this book about how I was stupid and I was an idiot and I just make colossally bad decisions. Right. People don't want to say that because somehow their self image, which is normal, is wrapped right. up in a career and what they do, which is very dangerous. So for me, you know, it took years i think to get there because i have this you know faith in god you know um it's still hard but it's like you know i'm not what i do i'm not just oh a fairfax of fairfax media and the dynasty that's uh, it's not who i am i'm just i'm an individual like everybody else it's an individual children of god so that helped a bit but yeah people are not willing to talk about Failure, unfortunately. Right. And they're and certainly not willing to talk about admit failure, admit their responsibility, and talk about lessons learned. It's right. just, I don't know, people don't want to go there. And that, that was kind of a one-two punch that you just described. Mm -hmm. First one was, you said, I realized in that in that executive coaching training and those mm -hmm. things that you had a leadership voice, you mm -hmm. realize that there was that, that mm -hmm. there's another little bloom where you're like, Oh, I have mm -hmm. a, I have a leadership voice. And then the next thing, your story could impact people. You thought that, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, I know in certain experiences, we all think our case is unique. Our story mm -hmm. is unique. And you know, if you're um, a journalist like I was, and you have, you know, some rough times and you're, and, well, a lot of people have that. There aren't a whole sure. lot of people that have your story. So you really are unique. Right. And yet right. the, the emotions and the impact of your story really does reach to people who aren't normal, as you said, normal right. people sitting in a pew. The feelings of uh, failure, of shame, of uh, loss of self-respect, thinking that other people, I mean, there were 
years when um, I wouldn't go to an Oxford uh, or have a business school reunion. I would feel too embarrassed, too ashamed. Right. Um, it took years. I think it wasn't until 2009 I went to an Oxford reunion, which I know decades after I went there, hey, yeah, nobody cared um, if they ever knew, and maybe some did. Went to a Harvard Business School reunion, uh, maybe a few years after that. And again, you know, nobody really cared. And But it, yeah, it's funny, most people don't really care about other people. They're too worried about their own lives. Right. But we think they do. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was just too embarrassed or ashamed to go to either one. It was just, yeah, I just wanted to hide, if you will. The, um, and it's, there are people listening right now and watching right now, Warwick, who, who have experienced that shame, who've experienced that feeling of letting people down, who, who, as you say those words, they're identifying with you. Maybe some of them are like, Ooh, man, I'm, I'm not a fail, but I didn't lose 2.25 mm -hmm. billion. Right. I mean, there, mm -hmm. there, there's a camaraderie there that they've been through that. And hopefully they're listening in because you found a road back. And one of the things that crucible leadership is about is road mapping a little bit that road back from the devastation of a crucible to a life of significance. Talk a little bit about what that process looks like. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess more generally, for me, it was um, growing up in Fairfax media and then certainly when I was in control, I realized it was just a terrible fit for me. I'm a reflective advisor. I'm shy by nature. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it's not as obvious now because I love learning. So it's not like I sit there and don't talk to people really quite the opposite. Uh, but basically I don't like the limelight. I don't like to be the lead dog, if you will. I, I'm happy to be in a group. I'm on a couple of nonprofit boards. That's a good fit, but you know, I'm not a Rupert Murdoch. It was just, it was mm -hmm. a terrible fit. I don't like to be in the limelight. So that was one lesson is be who you were designed to be. And I was being exactly who I wasn't designed to be. No wonder it didn't work. You know, right. um, could somebody else who was more of a take charge leader, you know, uh, strolled around the editorial floor, you know, got to know folks, met with banks, hey, you know, I just want to chat. And, you know, I would just go up in the elevator to the uh, top floor just not wanting to talk to anybody. I just, I just felt mm. so like not embarrassed, but just so out of it that, yeah, I mean, so much, what was needed, it was it always would have been difficult with the debt we had, but a different personality, could they have made that work? Who's to say But so be who you designed to be. And the other thing was, um, this wasn't my vision. Mm -hmm. It was really, I don't know if it was even my father's vision. Uh, you know, he was a philosopher. He wrote books on trying to get a synthesis between different religions. I mean, he was intellectual, very thoughtful, a good writer, absolutely. But I wouldn't say the greatest businessman in the world. Right. Uh, and, you know, there are photos of him in his younger days. He's in the office and he's looking kind of dour. And then there's ones of him in the country. He had a, like a 2000 acre pole, a Hereford stud, you know, cattle. He's got his straw hat on and he's got a big smile. <laughs> he just enjoyed more being in the country, if you will. Right. So I don't know that he it was, it wasn't really his vision per se. It was the founder. So, you know, you got to be who you were designed to be and pursue a vision that's your vision. You can't inherit a vision. And so that's kind of what I was, that's what I was doing. I mean, two huge life mistakes of not being who you were designed to be and not pursuing a vision that's your vision that, Again, in my 20s, I didn't think about any of that That's right. at all. So those are probably the two biggest lessons for me. And the only thing, fair to say, the only thing that led you to realize it wasn't your vision and that wasn't how you were designed, absent the crucible, absent the, the failed takeover, mm -hmm. do you think you ever would have got there? No. No, I mean, because duty is such a huge thing I never would have left. There's just no, there's no, I, I couldn't, I would have felt like I'm letting my dad down. There's, there's no way 
I could have left. And so in one, some strange way, it's, it's a strange thing to say it was a, it was a gift mm-hmm. that the company went on. It wasn't a gift to a whole bunch of people. You know, <laughs> right. I mean, the company right. went on. People didn't lose their jobs, fortunately. But yes, people and the company, some say, wasn't that well managed afterwards. So now I even get blamed for that. Hey, if the Fairfax right. has been in charge, it would have been okay, which who knows. But so, yeah, it wasn't too good for a lot of other people. But uh, certainly for me personally, um, it was sort of a blessing in disguise to be uh, freed from this, I don't know, it sounds a bit of hyperbole, but gilded uh, prison, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Yeah, it's, uh, it was a blessing in some ways. I I could never have gotten out with uh, out that happening. So I don't know if there was some divine plan there or not, who's to say, but um, in some ways it was fortuitous. Right. And your experience was difficult moment, devastating moment, mm-hmm. shattering moments, the words you used, that experience led you to examine how you were designed. Um, mm-hmm. You allowed yourself, here's a word that you uh, use a lot, you allowed yourself and continue to allow yourself to be refined by the lessons you learned from that crucible experience. How does that work in terms of what you do yourself and what crucible leadership talks to those people who've gone through crucibles like you, what does that look like? Yeah. Yeah. So the refining process is not a one and done. Uh, It certainly wasn't with me. Uh, So obviously when the company went under painful, eventually in the night, I began to realize, you know, I would not, I'm not Rupert Murdoch. I was not cut out for this. That was evident to me. Right. Uh, that was an early lesson. Um, hey, it wasn't really my vision. I, I thought it was a good vision to have a well-run newspaper serving the country of Australia, serving society. That's a very noble vision, but it wasn't my vision. Right. There can be wonderful visions out there that we may not feel called or led to pursue uh, for us personally. So um, that was sort of an initial cycle as I began to uh, work in the uh, aviation services company, I realized, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of analytical. I can analyze and uh, dissect, synthesize uh, information, come up with recommendations. Okay, so I'm analytical. Okay, that's interesting. Another cycle, the finding cycle. Then as I got into coaching, it's like, wow, I'm actually good at this. I'm right. empathetic. I can listen. Um, I'm not judgmental in the sense I have opinions, but when I'm coaching somebody, it's about their life and their choices. And I deeply respect that. Again, okay, that's interesting. So I can be detached myself and really focus on the interests of the client. So, okay, I'm, I'm good at coaching. And then, huh, there's a leadership voice in there. That's interesting. Like I didn't realize that as I'm asking questions. So another cycle. And then when I'm giving that seven minute talk in church, uh, in um, uh, a lot of years, over 10 years ago now, actually. So I think I said 2003 before. It's actually it was 2008. So <laughs> must be a longer ago than I thought. <laughs> but anyway, um, so uh, yeah, I began to see, gosh, you know, I have some, a voice that might help people. And that led me to uh, drafting a manuscript of the book and to trying to get it published uh, in Australia, which didn't really work out because they wanted more of a, a sensational total right. book. And right. that's just not my personality. Happy to focus on my own flaws, not other people's. I was like, well, you, you really need a branding, a brand for this, like a marketing plan. Huh. So that led me to uh, a lot of great folks in um, uh, Signal in Denver and, and yourself, uh, helping with communications, public relations. So, all of those pieces came together. And as we looked at the manuscript, what's the core message in there? We came up with crucible leadership. Right. Well, none of this was exactly planned. I wanted to get a book published. I wasn't thinking <laughs> of building a brand. Right. Oh, I need a brand to get it published. Okay. It's not like I don't understand the concept of branding. I did go to Harvard Business School. I get the concept, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But, you know, I needed help. And I, you know, great blessing. I found a great team to help me. So there were these cycles that I began to learn more about myself and maybe grew and developed and, and 
was refined. So there were just steps each all along the way. So um, yeah, it's not a one and done thing. It's a lifelong learning process. Right. And it is in some ways like a 12, in some ways like a 12 step program in the sense that once you got it, you give it away is what they say in those programs. And once you absorb some of those lessons and walk them out and realize that there was, there was not just life after a crucible, but there was meaningful life after a crucible. You've kind of dedicated yourself now, focus crucible leadership on helping other people with that experience, right? Exactly. So really the focus of crucible leadership is helping other people uh, get beyond a crucible moment, which is, as I look at it, is a devastating, life-altering experience of excruciating pain. Who you uh, were before the crucible experience is never who you uh, are afterwards. Right. It's an inflection point. And when you go through that, you really have a couple of alternatives. You can either um, wallow in that, which often is really understandable because it's so painful, <clears throat> and want to hide under the covers and say, look, I'm just checking out of life. I'm just going to not see anybody for the next 30 years. And I don't know, I'm just going to hide. Right. You know? And I get it, it's understandable, I get it. Or you can say this was awful, it sucked, but you know, how can I use this pain to help others? And when you focus on helping other, other people, maybe trying to make the world a better place in some sense, there's a healing component of that. And I certainly found that within myself. So really helping people bounce back from adversity, from their crucible moments, help them lead lives of significance, which I think of as, a legacy of helping others, of uh, making the world a better place, whether it's on a large scale, in a neighborhood, it doesn't really matter. Um, that's really what I want to see, help people see that there is a road back. Mm -hmm. And the, that's the whole, out of that experience, out of that <coughs> crucible experience, being able to show people that there's a, that there's, hope beyond that really i'm at the end of the day what you're telling people is those moments do help you understand how you're defined but they don't define you necessarily you still have life after that you still have a chapter to write after that and you've experienced when you've told that story be it in church that time mm -hmm. or you've told that story we've had you on some other people's podcasts over the course right. of, you know the last several months and <clears throat> heard from people who've listened to that and what you've discovered is the same thing you discovered in that church, that your story, while unique to you, really resonates with people who hear it. Yeah, I mean, one of the podcasts I was on was um, a Harvard Business School alumni podcast called Skydeck. And obviously, you tend to think of Harvard Business School folks, of <clears throat> most of them being uh, very successful and CEOs and mm -hmm. doing really well, and many are. It's a great school, but... Um, uh, when I shared, uh, it, it's funny, um, one of the folks I think reached out to you and just said, you know, is, is Warwick okay He's talking about like failure and what he right. went through? And, <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, he is. That's kind of the point, is right. crucible leadership. Uh, but why did he say that? Because it's obviously unusual in, you know, Fortune 500 um, atmosphere, if you will. And so I got a number of messages afterwards from folks saying, thank you, you know, my company's going under or I had a huge reversal and, uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow with my family and um, what other alumni will think of me. And, uh, you know, I think I might have even shared in that particular podcast about wondering what other alumni would think of me. Right. Um, so yeah. it's... It feels like it's like I, I gave other people in some ways permission to say, you know, it's it's okay to, you know, we're all going to fail. It's more, you know, you, you can bounce back. There is life after failure. And maybe it gave people a little bit of hope. And that really, I mean, getting down to why we're here, that really is the idea that you have behind Beyond the Crucible. The idea there is to use story, right? Mm -hmm. To use not just your story, but the story of folks that you will interview as guests on this podcast, um, conversations you and I will have, pulling on 
the, mm -hmm. the observations you make about other people's stories who are in the news and in the culture, the idea behind it all is to help listeners find hope after their crucibles through the power of story. Is it? I mean, that's kind of what you're asking. Absolutely. And, you know, obviously my crucible is one of business failure, you know, losing a large family media business, but it could be getting fired, maybe passed over that promotion you felt like you should get. It could be a death in the family, a uh, death of a loved one. It could be, uh, you know, abuse, um, health challenge. There's many different kinds of crucibles. Some of the times it's your fault, sometimes it's not your fault. But I want to help people, whatever their crucible experience is, somehow get beyond it. And I'm under no illusion that it's easy. I mean, it took me right. a long, long time. Right. I mean, you, you know, and, and frankly, you know, when you go through that, it's almost like a severe injury. Yes, there's going to be a scar. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, I'm 100% over it. I'm bulletproof. Hey, I'm kind of good. And yeah, I mean, I think I'm in pretty good shape these days, relatively speaking, but it's not like there aren't any scarf. It's just unrealistic, you know. But trying to help people get beyond the crucible, the crucible moments and lead lives that are, you know, what I call of significance where you're helping others. Because when you're helping others, it's something that you can be proud of, your family can be proud of. It's like the whole tombstone analogy. Rarely will you um, have a tombstone that says, I was super successful. You, know, you right. told me about uh, Elvis Presley, and he doesn't talk about his platinum records. He talks about family. Right. So, you know, um, that's a, another element of significance of just something that you feel is can, is, can help others. Is, is it important in more of a eternal, uh, altruistic perspective? So helping people understand that that's, really a path to um, happiness, joy, in more of an overall sustainable manner right. than just pursuing the corporate ladder just because. Right. That is a great place to kind of land the plane, as I like to say right now. Um, what, before we go, what would you say? I've, you know, we've done a lot of conversation about your story and you've, you've talked to the, the uh, listeners about your story, but what would you say to them directly? What would you like them to know as they wrap up this episode and we move on to the next episodes where you're talking to other people about their stories, you're sharing more from your story and your experience. What would you like to say to the listeners now about coming back and, uh, and hearing more about what crucible leadership is all about? I think when you're in the midst of a crucible experience, a devastating gut wrenching uh, period in your life, you might feel life is over. You might feel nobody can love you. Nobody can forgive you. Uh, there's nothing you can do without screwing up. Um, you might just want to hide. Um, you might feel ashamed. Um, but I want people to understand as dark as those times are, uh, that there is hope. There is a path back. No, it won't be easy. No, you know, you might need help of varying kinds, depending on the kind of crucible you've gone through, but there is hope. There is light. Uh, and there, there is a path back. So that's, I think, the overriding message I'd love folks to, you know, maybe try and understand and, and believe. Well, that's a great place to land the plane, as I like to say. So Warwick, thanks so much for sharing your story with everybody today. Uh, and yours is, as we've talked about, is just the first of many stories that we'll share in this podcast about people who have, uh, who have been through crucibles and are moving forward to help listeners um, learn, you know, from those moments to help them get on the path to a life of significance. And thank you listeners uh, who have been spending time with us here uh, to make sure that you never miss an episode of Beyond the Crucible. Click on subscribe uh, at whatever podcast uh, app you're using to listen to this and you'll get all the new episodes as they come out. To learn more about Crucible Leadership in general, you can visit crucibleleadership.com. And while you're there, you can sign up for a blog that Warwick writes every couple of weeks, uh, really stuff that, talking about the same stuff we talked about today, but pulling more examples, more stories that will encourage you as you're walking back from your own crucible. You can also connect with Crucible Leadership on social media, on Facebook, it's at Crucible Leadership, on LinkedIn, it's at Warwick Fairfax with the silent W in the middle, W-A-R-W-I-C-K, at Warwick Fairfax on LinkedIn. So until next time, Remember that a crucible experience is not the end of your story. 
It's the beginning of another chapter of your story, a story that will lead to a life of significance.